Welcome to the Pemberley Podcast, a podcast where we discuss Jane Austen adaptations. I'm Yolanda Rodriguez. And I'm Jillian Davis. We are proud partners of the Frolic Podcast Network, a community made up of your favorite voices in all of Romancelandia and beyond. Keep up with us on Twitter and Instagram at the Pemberley, and you can email us at thepemberleypodcast at gmail.com. Hey everyone, today we're so excited to talk with author Suzanne Elaine, whose book Mr. Malcolm's List is out today. This Regency romantic comedy tells the story of the Honorable Mr. Jeremy Malcolm, who is searching for a wife who meets the qualifications of his well-crafted list. But after years of searching, he's beginning to despair, until Selena Dalton arrives in town. Selena, a vicar's daughter of limited means and a stranger to high society, is thrilled when her friend Julia Thistlewaite invites her to London until she learns it's all part of a plot to exact revenge on Mr. Malcolm after being spurned. It's such a fun story, perfect for any Austin fan, so we wanted to share it with all of you. We dive into the full journey this story has taken for Suzanne, from a short story 19 years ago, to screenplay, to short film, to book, and soon to be a movie. You can find where to buy the book and watch the short film on Suzanne's website at SuzanneElaine.com. Now, on to the interview. Everyone, please give it up for Suzanne Elaine. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. This is such a treat. Sure. We're so excited to have you on. Uh, we both read your book uh, that's out today, and we both thought it was just so funny and so layered and so wonderful. So uh, why don't we dive into the initial book? Because one of the things that's like so great and so fascinating about this story is you've just been working on it for so long. I mean, we read an article that said you thought of this 19 years ago. It's definitely not been an overnight success by any means, which I think is pretty realistic. Um, you hear a lot of, about films that are, you know, people, it's been a labor of love and a passion project, and it takes them, you know, a decade or more to get it to the big screen. So that's similar with this book I did. I had the idea initially for a man who had a list of requirements for a bride, and I actually wrote it was a short story and it was modern. It took place in modern times, which back then was 2001. <laughs> so is when I wrote the short story. But then I thought, wow, that would be so interesting to set that man in an era like the Regency era, where so much was dependent on the type of marriage you made. You know, this was such a huge thing, as we know, in, in the Austin era. I used that as a starting ground to writing the novel, Mr. Malcolm's List. That's awesome. Is the short story published anywhere? No. And you know, it's funny, since the book is coming out, I, I thought recently, I don't even really know where it is. And I'm like, I should go back through my old computer <laughs> hard drives. You know? I've got my old laptop somewhere, but I don't even know if it would boot up. But yeah, um, no, it, unfortunately, it's been it's been lost to the um, cyberspace. <laughs> I don't know where it is. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, that's like good to know that that exists, though. Um, so we read that Jane Austen was a huge inspiration to you, and we're obviously fans of hers as well. Um, so do you have a favorite Jane Austen book? And was there one of her books in particular that inspired you to create the Regency version of Mr. Malcolm's List? Well, definitely Pride and Prejudice is my favorite Austin novel. And I've loved that. I haven't reread it recently. So I'm like, okay, I'm due for a rereading pretty soon. And I've been rereading some of her, the ones that I didn't love as much, which is so funny. I feel like at different times in your life, you know, if you reread a book, then your opinion changes. So it was, it's funny. I really never liked Mansfield Park. And then I reread it a couple months ago and I was like, oh, this, you know, she has a few of those singers in there, too. You know, <laughs> you have to search mm -hmm. a little harder for them. But Pride and Prejudice, I guess I just loved, you know, uh, Elizabeth Bennett is just the perfect heroine, in my opinion. And I just thought she was amazing. And then, of course, just the characters, as always, Mr. Collins um, and, you know, all the people she's just Jane Austen just made fun of everyone just so well, like, <laughs> you know, it, it just poked fun at all their idiosyncrasies. And these characters are just amazing. And right now I'm rereading Emma. So I guess to answer your question, I'm taking the long way around. But Pride and Prejudice is my favorite. It was an inspiration for Mr. Malcolm's List. And I think 
probably you can see that with Mr. Malcolm. He's kind of like a Mr. Darcy figure. But also Emma, because then we've got Julia Thistlewaite, who is running around being manipulative and controlling. You know? Yeah. So that's got a touch of Emma in it as well. Thinking back to Mr. Darcy, like, you know, there was no official list the way that Mr. Malcolm has one, but he, he certainly has like a tall order for what he expects of a wife. Yeah. And there's even that scene where he discusses with Elizabeth and Miss Bingley, I think was there, about what he considers an accomplished woman. So so that was definitely an inspiration and thinking, well, what requirements, if this man actually existed in, you know, 1818 England, what requirements would be on his list? So I actually went back to that list Mr. Darcy had of an accomplished woman. And I I picked a couple of those from from his list. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask, I've got the screenshot of Mr. Malcolm's list right here. What do you think is the most difficult item on the list to achieve? Oh, wow. That's a hard question. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe number 10 has genteel relations from good society because no one can control their relatives, right? And we've all been embarrassed by something, you know, someone we've been related to. We're like, oh my goodness, why did they do that or say that? (laughs) And that was the thing in Pride and Prejudice, you know, he was put off by her mother, you know, and her behavior. So I think number 10 would be the hardest thing because really, you know, like I said, you can't control it. Um, Number nine possesses musical artistic talent. I have no artistic talent at all. (laughs) Like I can't draw to save my life. But that was a huge thing in those time what is it about the list that makes it feel so unattainable you know like because oh. obviously like Ju- julia's character thinks she can do anything thinks she can have anything she's like i i failed this list how could i <laughs> fail this list and it it sort of wonders it's sort of set up to make anyone fail right well it was funny the one that julia failed was converses in a sensible fashion and i think that was a very big thing too. conversation. You know, could you have a, a intelligent conversation with this person and poor thing? <laughs> yeah. As we saw in the short film, she kind of, kind of messed up there, but I don't think it actually was necessarily that difficult. I think the list was actually pretty reasonable, you know, except for maybe the ones that if you can't draw or sing, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's not your fault. But a a lot of these other things, I think a man would expect, you know, his wife to meet a lot of these qualifications. And even, you know, handsome of countenance and figure, that's in the eye of the beholder. So, you know, you know, it's like it didn't didn't mean she had to be, you know, a supermodel, but, you know, someone that he could be attracted to. When I wrote it down, I did think, what should he expect in a wife? So I didn't try to make it like something they couldn't Mm -hmm. meet. And I think that's part of of the point is that if it were the right person, they would meet these requirements or enough to, you know, where it's like, okay, that is the person I'm looking for. And then I think too, like at the very end, I think he says something like his list is, oh, what I'm doing, I'm giving a spoiler. What? (laughs) (laughs) I hate to work. I mean, if you want to give spoilers, we can just like label it like there's spoilers here. Don't no, no, wa- no. listen to I, this if you've I read it. I won't give a spoiler, but okay, I can do this without spoiling it. But just in general, like all of us probably have these qualities we're looking for, whether we write them down, you know, and, and we have definite qualities we're looking for in a relationship with, with our significant other so and sometimes we actually make compromises on that (laughs) and we're actually surprised to find later that maybe our qualifications have changed or our list of requirements have Mm. changed if your heart's involved your head eventually it goes out the window (laughs) so (laughs) if someone was really spectacular then and they didn't meet every requirement you know he could have bent the rules I think (laughs) That's good to know. Diving into like the screenplay portion of Mr. Malcolm's list, we're very excited to see the movie that will eventually get made. What were some unique challenges in adapting your own work from book to screenplay? This was another thing I did so long ago, and I was so naive when I did it. I knew nothing about screenwriting. 
basically I had written the novel and then there were some reviews and people said um, that they could see it as a movie and that they really enjoyed the dialogue. And I started to think, wow, I really do enjoy writing dialogue. I enjoy that a lot more than writing description. And I started to think, well, maybe this is, you know, this would be a better field of writing to get into is screenwriting. And then in 2011, there was a contest sponsored by Amazon. So they were getting, that was right as they were starting to get into filmmaking. And they had a site called Amazon Studios. It was free to upload you know, screenplays. So at this point, I didn't even have final draft. You know, I had adapted Mr. Malcolm's Listen to a, a screenplay in Word of all things, which was Whoa. like, a, it was a nightmare. I'm like trying to format and, you know, but I uploaded it onto that Amazon Studios contest. They ran one monthly for about a year and it was a semi finalist. That is when I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe this, there is something here. And then I started really educating myself about screenwriting. And, you know, I, I invested in Final Draft. And, and I really, really started working on it and revised it a few times. I got actually a phone call from Amazon. Then um, I tried, like, cold querying, like, <laughs> sending out emails about it. And I got a phone call from a director whose advice to me was stop writing period pieces. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, she was like, I loved it. It was wonderful, but it's so hard to get a period piece produced in Hollywood, which actually mm. is, she's not wrong. It is very difficult. In 2014 is when I uploaded the script, Mr. Malcolm's List, onto the blacklist. It is a um, website that any aspiring screenwriter or even professional screenwriter can upload their screenplay and host it on that website and they can pay a nominal fee to get a review from a professional reader. So this, these are readers who work in Hollywood, usually reading for studios or executives. The reader will rate the screenplay on a scale of from one to 10. And anything that gets an eight or above, an email will be generated and sent to Hollywood executives, producers, managers, mm -hmm. agents, directors. At that time, the first review that I got on it was a nine out of 10, which was so surprising to me. I was like, really? <laughs> That's kind of when things started taking off as far as, you know, my screenwriting career. So I started getting calls from agents, managers. I found representation. And then the Blacklist at that time, too, they had a podcast. It was called Blacklist Table Reads. And they would do a table read of some of their scripts that had either scored well on the site or on they also had an annual list of of screenplays they did a table read of my scripts in the summer of 2015 that's when emma holly jones the director of the short film and the director of the upcoming feature film that's when she heard the um screenplay for the first time heard it on the blacklist heard of it even and she was a huge Austin fan and had always wanted to produce you know um, a period piece based in the Regency era I think probably her dream was to do like an Austin adaptation but from what she said I think she felt this was just as good <laughs> you know because it's an original property form of literature that uh, that is so much like or is an homage to Jane Austen. So anyway, she contacted my agent and then that's when she got involved and she's worked so hard. That's why we, I mean, that's really why it's gone anywhere <laughs> because that producer who called me and told me that if I keep writing period pieces, I probably wouldn't get anything produced was probably, <laughs> probably correct. But because of Emma's passion for the project, it has proceeded. And then Refinery29 was so kind as to give us the money to make the short film and that really has helped generate, you know, more enthusiasm for the project. So now it's going to actually be made into the feature. Yay, that's exciting. <laughs> I actually uh, heard Mr. Malcolm's List on the Blacklist Table Reads five years ago as well. Really? Wow. Yeah, yeah that's, I mean, that was the first time I heard it. It was funny because I, I had sort of just graduated college and I was like starting to like plug into a lot more Hollywood things and when I first learned about the blacklist, like I learned about it about the same time that Mr. Malcolm's list came out on the table reads and I heard it and I thought it was fantastic. Oh, thank 
you. That's so nice to hear. That's amazing. What a small world. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right. So, um, I mean, because one of the things that we really love about this story is that like the like it's a period piece, but the complications of love uh, feel very modern. So like what kind of modern issues of love did you put into this story? Oh, wow. So he was this really sought after he was the most eligible catch of the season and all that. And it was that he felt like, did people really care about him or was it, you know, his reputation? So I guess there's something like fame and, and money, you know, is that what do people really, what are they after? Or even uh, superficial things like looks, you know, what is it that they really are, you know, falling in love with? Or can you reveal the real you? Because the list acted kind of like a shield to him so that, you know, he, he could protect himself from getting too close to anyone. I think that's a big thing too, because this was something I had a hard time with is I was, I had a little bit of fear of falling in love and commitment. You know, it's like um, that feeling of control, like you'll lose control if you let someone in, you know? So I think some of that is in there too. You know, Julia, I think is an interesting character. It's funny, she's getting a lot of hate. <laughs> And I just like her. I think she's someone who doesn't know what she wants. At that time, marriage, you know, for women, there were no real, you couldn't have a real career or pursue higher education. So this was like the way that you showed your success, like what kind of match you were able to make. So I think that's part of it too, like this feeling like, because I feel like people still have this feeling like, you're judged based on who you attract or if you attract someone. And that's so wrong to me. Like, who cares? You know, you're who you are. It doesn't matter if you're in a relationship. So I guess that's kind of in there too. She thinks her, her self-worth and self-esteem are tied to who, you know, she's able to attract as a as a suitor. And that's really the wrong way of looking at it, in my opinion. For sure. Why don't we dive into the short film a bit? First, we want to ask what made and what makes Emma Holly Jones, your director, the right partner for this? Probably her perseverance. And um, <laughs> she, she doesn't take no for an answer. She works so hard. That short film, you know, it's only 10 minutes, but it, we filmed it in three days. And you know, just the amount of work that goes into a production, especially historical production, is just incredible. I think what makes her the right partner, too, is her ability to, to also pick the right partners. So, for example, the woman who did the score for the short film, Emily Rice, she actually was nominated for an award for that. And it's just a beautiful wow. score. And, you know, she found her and, um, you know, the casting director just did an awesome job. The producers that are involved are just so super hardworking and passionate about the project, too, and just lovely women. So with a director, what I've in with the little experience I have thus far, it does seem to me that you a director really has to know, too, who to pick, you know, to collaborate with, who will bring that. You, their vision to the screen and I think she's really really good at finding these just amazing talents and so how did the story evolve or change once she got involved well it was her idea to do the diverse casting so when I wrote the book and the script I I really was not I, I wasn't thinking casting at all to tell you the truth um it's funny that's one of the questions you get asked and I was always kind of stumped <laughs> When people were like, who do, who do you want to play this or that? She heard the um, screenplay on the Blacklist, Table Reads podcast, and then she saw Hamilton shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. And that's when she kind of got this idea, wow, what if we did Mr. Malcolm's List with diverse casting? So that was her brainchild. And having, you know, I think what was really great about all this is that Refinery29 gave us the money to make the short film because it is it is a bold decision that was done as a proof of concept and it worked, you know, and now we can point to the, to the short film and say, look how beautiful it is. And it does work. And, you know, these care, these characters can be played by a diverse cast. So that mm -hmm. was something, you know, that was really an awesome idea that she came up with. I give total credit to her. And then, 
with the short film, I think it really, you know, it really proved that we can now make a feature in the same way and it, and it'll be amazing. That's yeah. great. Um, so we'd love to hear any stories from set or anything you have to tell us about the short film. We absolutely loved it. Okay. Well, good. Yeah. I love the short film too. I mean, and I think that's what's so amazing about this is as a writer to see something so beautiful, you know, produced, you know, that originally was just something in your head. You know? <laughs> I remember when we showed up on set, my husband went with me, there were carriages, horse-drawn carriages and people in Regency attire. And I'm like, this is, this is crazy. Uh, I can't believe these were just all things that were in my head. And now they're here in front of me. The outdoor scenes were all filmed at Kenwood House, which was where, I don't know if you all saw the movie Bell. Um, no. I, I haven't seen it, no. Oh, not yet. You, really, you really should see it. But that is where the real life Bell was raised. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's where she was raised at Kenwood House in Hampson Heath, London. And it's just a beautiful location. Also, they did a scene um, from Notting Hill at this location. Wow. So, um, so we started there at Kenwood House. That was the first day. And unfortunately, and that was our only real outdoor shooting day. But unfortunately, it rained. That was the day it rained. No. So all, yeah, so all those scenes you see outside where like Frida Pinto is getting out of the carriage and mm -hmm. um, Chopin D or Sue, he's looking at her and he's riding his horse. Those were all filmed in the rain. And even um, like uh, Mr. Malcolm and Cassie as they're walking and the girl drops her reticule, that was filmed in the rain. So it was, you know, not the most favorable of shooting conditions, but, um, but still we got through it and it was, and also what was funny is they wouldn't let us close down close it down completely but it was like a national trust heritage or house or something it was something oh, okay. like you know that's open to the public um and they wouldn't close it while we were filming <laughs> so people were like walking their dogs and you know <laughs> jogging you know and everyone's like you know, they're stopping and looking like, you know, sure, what like what's this exhibition we just happened to walk upon? Like, can yeah. we join? <laughs> yeah, it was so funny. And then I felt so sorry for, um, I, I forget the exact title for them, but the people who worked with us, whose job it was, they were, you know, on the edges, like trying to shoot people away. And, but they couldn't, oh. they couldn't totally like, it, it was like this delicate balance because the people were allowed to be there, but they were like, right. when we were filming, please, could you just, could you not walk? Right. You know? And then I think there were actually a few people who did get in there anyway, that had to be digitally removed, <laughs> you know, just like in the background or something. Wow. So. Right. so no modern people appeared in the, in the short film. <laughs> no, they were trying, maybe they were trying to get in there. I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember it even being rainy in the scene where they're walking. Did they digitally remove, Move the rain or was it so light <laughs> that you don't notice it? it you know it did stop and start so there were mm -hmm. periods where it was really light I think when he was on his horse there were some times that that it got a little heavy then but yeah and so this is my other funny story from the filming I had this great idea to get my picture taken with Frida Pinto and so I'm like asking my husband babe, take, take a picture of me and Frida Pinto together. So he takes the picture. Frida Pinto is the most beautiful human <laughs> that has ever walked to the face of the earth. And it has been raining. Like, I didn't look that great. I had gotten in from a transatlantic flight, you know, like the day before and gotten up at the crack of dawn and been standing in the rain, you know. And it was a little chilly, so, you know, my nose was pink and I had chap lips. So I'm standing in this picture next to Frida Pinto, who's just luminous and beautiful. And he shows it to me. He's like, look, I, I got your picture together. And I'm like, oh, this is terrible. Oh, no. <laughs> I look terrible. And he's like, you do not. And my husband is so sweet. He has no judgment as far as when I look bad in a picture because he thinks I look good, which is very sweet, but it's, it's not real. <laughs> So he's like, no, no. And he's like, she just got her makeup done. If you'd gotten your makeup done, you would have looked just like that. And I'm like, no, 
I wouldn't. There's no, you know, not in a million years would I ever look like Frida Pinto, no matter how much makeup anyone put on me. There was another effect of this whole incident. So there was a premiere in LA. We flew out for that. And I was like, okay, I've learned my lesson from the first time because I was <laughs> like, like smiling so big in the picture of me and Frida Pinto. I'm like, I look like such a goof. I'm like, I just can't <laughs> smile. That's, that's the moral of the story. Don't smile because then you just look ridiculous. So we take all these pictures at the premiere and I am not, I'm like, you know, just have this really strained, like half closed mouth smile on my face the whole time. And I just look like I'm terrified. And, and, oh, no. <laughs> and my friends were like, what did they do to you? Did they do that? I'm like, they did nothing. Oh, no. I, just, I, just, I did all this to myself. This is, <laughs> this is totally self-imposed. So anyway, that's my taking pictures with celebrity story. And then the next day I got one with Jenna Chan, but this was not even my idea. My husband was like, go, go stand next to Jimmy Chan. I'll take your picture. And I'm like, have we learned nothing? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, she is beautiful, you know, absolutely gorgeous too. I do not want to stand next to her, you know, get us like 10 feet away. That would be much better. So well, hopefully but, then for the film, uh, you'll get some better pictures yeah. and then do a quick check with your husband and be like, is this one good? Is this one good? <laughs> yeah. I know. I'm hoping I'm like, please let me learn my lesson by the time, like if, you know, if we have a premiere or something just you know I've just decided I have to smile no matter how goofy it is because it just looks at least you look happy you know sure. <laughs> yeah I mean you want to show up as yourself always um but so wait are these pictures online or are they <laughs> so the ones at the premiere you can see online they were published okay. and they're on our Instagram account Mr. Malcolm's list the Instagram account there's some from the premiere and also on mine, Susanna Lane, if you go to either of those, you can see. The one of me and Frida is still on my phone. <laughs> right. maybe, I'll, maybe I'll ask one day if I can share, but I don't know. I, I'm a little sensitive now because I'm like, am I, you know, I'm just worried. Like, I have this favorite um, little video of Sam Hewen that I, it was when he was, promoting like there was a win a date with Sam Hewen thing and he did this that. promo for it and he he's with these little Scottish kids and it's the funniest thing ever and it was funny before he was ever attached to being Mr. Malcolm's List I'm like I'm gonna I'm gonna tweet this video or I'm gonna post this on my Instagram because this is just the cutest thing and now that he's attached to Mr. Malcolm's List I'm like maybe I should get permission because I'm like you know, you know it's just a whole new level of like well you know, maybe they don't want that. But anyway, so yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be more careful about what I put out there. But yeah, it's hard, because then you can't just be like, their typical normal fan and be fangirling. <laughs> you <know? laughs> You're a fan, but you have to sign stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. funny. Oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. So talking about the feature film, Sam Hewen, all that, everyone. So filming uh, starts next year in Ireland. Is there anything that you can tell us that we didn't read in deadline? <laughs> Unfortunately not. It's a little bit up in the air, as you're probably aware, because of all of this coronavirus. So, uh, you know, it's, it, it is supposed to start in Ireland early spring next year. So hopefully you know, we get to do that. Some of the new things recently, like in the last month, it was announced Sam Hewen and, and uh, Constance Wu. I can, I can tell you that, um, that, you know, we are disappointed. Jim and Chan, she wasn't able to make it work with all the scheduling changes. She did an awesome job in the short film, but I'm excited about Constance Wu because she's such a great comedian. And so I've been kind of watching some, I watched Fresh Off the Boat in the past but I hadn't watched it thinking that Constance Wu was going to play <laughs> Julia Thistleway. <Right. laughs> so I've been, um, I've been rewatching some of those episodes and she's just brilliant as well. So I'm excited to see her take on that character. I think that'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, we're excited to see her too. Cool. So, I mean, what has it been like seeing everything, the casting, costumes, locations and everything come together from like that idea that you had 19 years ago? Wow. It was, it's been pretty crazy surreal. Like, um, it, I think another funny thing about the casting was Oliver Jackson Cohen plays Lord Cassidy and, or Cassie as he's called. And that was another revelation to me when I was on set for the fil filming of the short film, because 
the producers had sent me like some of his reels of, of other roles and they were all very serious. So I hadn't seen him being funny until we actually started filming and he is just so hilarious as Cassie. So I'm really excited about that. And also in the short film, since I'm calling out the actors, Divian Ladwa played a footman in the short film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and you're nodding. So I'm assuming you loved his performance as well. Yeah. Him and the maid <laughs> both had like a yes. great dynamic so and they funny. were very funny. Her yeah. too. Her too. Um, Shanae Gregory or Shana Gregory. She's a Welsh actress. She was just adorable. And that was kind of funny because I arrived on set and you know, it was early and I got no sleep the night before and the director meets me and she's like, hey, we've got this great, you know, actor and actress. They're playing the footman and the maid. So give them a give them a line. <laughs> and, and so I, that that whole part where um, the carriage is coming and they turn to each other and he says, um, I hear she's from the country. And then um, Shanae Gregory says, um, hush, you know, posture, you know, that was all, that was all kind of added at the last minute. And then some of the other, um, just the facial expression of Divian Ladwa, the, the footman at the opera house, uh, that was something that Emma actually, she asked, she, she, we filmed it as written in the script. And then she wanted to add something from him because he was, he's just such a great actor. He was actually in Lion with Nicole Kidman and Dev Patel. Mm -hmm. So he's just, he's just amazing. And, but that's what's so amazing too. That was such a dramatic role. And here he was just being so funny and humorous. So it, I think what it was really amazing to me is that, you know, I, I didn't necessarily know who was going to be funny or, you know, and, uh, and so that's when I should have trusted the director and the casting director. So now from now on, I do. They're tiny, tiny little roles. They got amplified a little bit in the short film. I mean, they were they didn't have any lines at all, but I think maybe in the feature, we might see a little more of them as well, just because mm. they they kind of stole the show in the short film. <laughs> That's so fun. So our sort of roles like that, because what was fun about seeing that was it sort of created a, a new sort of upstairs, downstairs dynamic, yeah. very sort of Downton Abbey. Do you, can we look forward to seeing stuff like that and like their characters grow a bit in the film? Yes. And that is, you were asking what had the director kind of brought to this. And that was something she brought to it because that was not something I had necessarily thought of. And she did immediately, you know, even like um, the little gestures where the footman, you know, he uh, adjusts the vase as he's going up the stairs, you the know, just details. Yeah. yeah, the little details. Those were things that, you know, Emma kind of they, they weren't necessarily in the original script. There was a little bit of servant action, but it, it was very minimal. And now I think it's definitely going to be highlighted more in the future film. So that'll awesome. be fun. Awesome. <laughs> so do you plan on being on set for the filming of the whole feature? Yeah, I hope to be. I hope they invite me. <laughs> I hope that I can be in Ireland when it's filmed. That would be just a dream come true. I mean, I would love to go to Ireland anyway. So, <laughs> And to sure. be there to see this beautiful historical production. I mean, that's like the most exciting thing coming up in my life right now, for sure. And to see to see these actors because they really are just so talented. It is pretty remarkable to see how they can embody those characters and bring them to life. For sure. And when that happens, kidding, not kidding. If you need extras, if you need PAs, if you need onset cheerleaders, we're happy to offer our services for free. <laughs> it's great. We don't care. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll keep it in mind and I'll let uh, I'll let Emma Holly know as well. <laughs> awesome. So so as far as what's next, you've like totally gone full circle with this movie because you started with the short story that became a book that became a short film or that became a screenplay rather that kind of became like a short film to promote it. That's like in the works to be a feature film. Could a musical be in the future? <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny you say that because one of the producers on this is such a fan of musicals. So when we were at the, the short film shoot, we were talking about it. We're like, and we were shooting the opera scene. So we're all in this theater and I'm like, you know, 
I don't know who brought it up, but we're like, yeah, there needs to be a Mr. Malcolm's List, the musical. <laughs> and the producer's like, yeah, I would love that. So <laughs> yeah, I'm on board for that too. I mean, that would be, that would be amazing. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, uh, I mean, you, cause you've been working on this story for such a long time. Are you working on any other projects next? Yes. I'm actually halfway through writing the follow-up to Mr. Malcolm's List. It's called Miss Lattimore's Letter. <laughs> Ooh. I was just kind of hitting my groove when, you know, all this kind of happened with the um, promotion and, and this and Mr. Malcolm's List release. So um, I'm looking forward to, I mean, this is lovely and I'm enjoying it, but then when it, the dust settles and then I can, I can get back into the second book. But it's interesting because, you know, you were asking me what I felt um, Mr. Malcolm's List, which Jane Austen book kind of it was inspired by. And so I feel like this follow-up is kind of like, uh, so Mr. Malcolm's List was kind of like a Pride and Prejudice slash Emma. And I feel like the follow-up is kind of a persuasion slash Emma because it's got a 28-year-old heroine, which we know in Austen years is like 60. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but she's, you know, she's like the shout kind of the a chaperone for her younger cousin so it's kind of got that persuasion mm. you know where you've got I mean it's obvious 28 is not old I was teasing because in persuasion I think she's like 27 and you know mm-hmm. <laughs> but um but anyway that's Miss Lattimore's letter so I'm excited about that and it's and also I think it's kind of similar to persuasion because a good deal of it takes place in Bath like persuasion mm. did so that uh, that's fun too because I'm doing all this research on bath and it's so much fun it really makes me want to go there i've been there before but it makes me want to go back i did find this really cool book that um a woman who lives in bath wrote about the gardens there and it was a garden that jane austen used to go to sydney gardens and Mm. that's been so much fun delving into all that research and looking at the pictures and yeah it's been a lot of fun and enjoying it that's awesome is this book, Mrs. Lat- or Miss Latter's Letters, is it going to take place like in the same universe as Mr. Malcolm's List, or is it its own separate book? It's kind of its own separate book. I, I tried just with the title to kind of tie it in a little bit, you know, but it's, there are none, none of the characters, you know, reappear. It's, um, it's an entirely new set of characters, so. You should try okay. and like create your own Marvel version of this <laughs> world. <laughs> You know, that's funny. You're not the first person who told me that. I mean, <laughs> they were like, we could, ha- you know, you could have like a whole series of, of movies with just the Mr. Malcolm's List universe. And I'm like, hey, that sounds good to me. <laughs> we will be waiting patiently. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks again so much, Suzanne. For all of you out there, you can buy Mr. Malcolm's List. It's out today. We're including a link to Suzanne's website, which is just SuzanneElaine.com, where you can buy the book. Stay tuned for next week. <laughs> <laughs>